All right, guys, we're going to get started. Uh, it's a few minutes after, but um, we had some technical things to take care of. So yeah, uh, welcome to this presentation. We're going to be talking about how to find your own potential or a team's potential through creating a user guide, um, specifically paying attention to the, the diversity. Um, we'll talk a lot about that, as you'll see. So this is a disclaimer. I always wondered why hackers at hacker conferences had to do this, and now I'm the one doing it. Um, basically, this is just saying that this is my work. Um, it, doesn't, it isn't owned or influenced directly by people that I work for or have worked for. So today, we're going to um, have Wynn come up and give a redux of a talk that he used to give in the early 2010s. Um, and then once he's done with that, I'll come back and talk to you a little bit about how um, I got to this place from him taking those steps back in the early 2010s. Uh, go through a little bit of adaptation versus accommodation and why accommodation is important. And then finally, talking about the user manual. So I will hand it over to Wynn. Hi, I'm Wynn. I'm white. And I have been the victim of discrimination. Nothing like what is currently going on, but an entirely different view that made me very sensitive to what is happening in today's. Which button does what? Uh, enter right arrow. Right arrow? Yep. OK. Uh, high school and I did not get along very well. So at the tender age of 16, I decided I was going to go to work for the man. And back in those days, the man, the best engineering opportunities that I could possibly have and have them pay for, which was the way things used to be, was to go to work for Ma Bell, AT&T, work out at Bell Labs and research the hell out of everything and become an expert. And it was all. And that was my dream at 16. I didn't have a high school diploma. But I was smart, and I could pass the English test and the calculus test and all the written tests. And so the HR lady and I are going, this is a fit. Now, I'm in jeans and sneakers, nothing quite as a. And so we're all ready to sign the papers, and Wynn's going to go out there, and he's going to get trained and all this other stuff. But then discrimination, believe it or not. I got handed what used to be a 2048 pair telephone cable. HR lady pulled out a pair of them and said, what color are they? Wynn is colorblind. <laughs> and I go, uh, well, the fluorescent lights are influencing 3,000 angstroms. She goes, no, but what color is it? Well. Several pulls of pairs of wires later, HR ladies in tears, and I'm somewhere between tears, pissed off, and on my way with fake ID to an Irish bar in New York City at 16 years old. Why are you laughing at th this was painful, woman? <laughs> so I recovered and decided I was going to go to work for the second best company you could possibly get an education from in 1969. What company would that be? Anybody? Shout it out. You're not the US Army. <laughs> I didn't qualify, not with Neanderthal feet. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. IBM. Right across the street on Madison Avenue from AT&T. So I go in. And I do the tests, and I'm a geek, and I had already been messing with computers such as we had. I was not a bad beginning electrical engineer, because my father made sure that if I, we were going to have dinner, I could do my electrical circuits by the age of 11. And everything was great. I was going to go up to walk. I was going to be at Watson Research Labs. I was going to do all of this great stuff. But I was the victim of discrimination. Because for me to do that, they wanted me to look like Ross Perot. <laughs> <laughs> and I had hair down to here. And I don't have any beard. I can't grow one. 
But they wanted me to turn from that into this, to work for IBM. So I ended up getting into sex, drug, and rock and roll and became a recording engineer and producer instead in the family business. Fast forward to what Kaylee was talking about, and this is G. Mark was 2011 or 2012 RSA, Janet Napolitano, then the head of DHS, uh, was giving a keynote. And she said the following, we cannot find enough talent to fill the cybersecurity gap. There were two words, depending upon your vernacular, or one word that has a B and an S in it, and I shouted it loudly. I said, what you really mean is you can't find a night enough white Mormon boys who've never smoked a joint in their life to come to work for you because you have zero tolerance for people that are different than you. And that is part of what began uh, some, I got really pissed off, I really did. <laughs> And I wrote some articles, and it inspired a lot of people. Uh, I gave a keynote at um, uh, DHS, actually, the, that following summer. And uh, they said, what are you going to talk about? I said, do you really want me to tell you in advance? They go, no, maybe not, because you might get censored. <laughs> and so we began with, women are useless. That went well with the audience. And I said, what you really need is to get the 1950s out of your head. This is what we need. We need people that think differently than us. How many of you have the ability to go through 200,000 lines of code to find two misplaced semicolons? One hand in the back, and you're on the spectrum, sir. Yeah, <laughs> bam! It's on this. Certain people with certain mental facilities can do this and love it and adore it. Yet, can they get through the HR lady? And that began sort of my ranting about hiring the unhirable. Jason Street earlier today was talking about ADHD and Tesla and Edison. You've got to get people out of your normals. You don't need more normals. We got enough normals. What you really need is abnormals. And one of the biggest things that's finally loosening up a little, but if there's any feds in the room, oh, sorry dudes, let people smoke weed at work for God's sakes. <laughs> Seriously. Apparently, you still cannot go to work for the feds if you are a current purveyor of uh, uh, whether it's Delta 8 version, Delta 9 version, any of those versions. And the reason is they want you to be able to run for Congress, and you must be a full-blown alcoholic to run for Congress. <laughs> but that's OK. It's OK to be that. We know how to tax it. <laughs> the other thing that we all expect now if you're hiring somebody for an IT job somewhere in operations and I'm a candidate and you ask me have you ever failed and I go no everything I've done has always worked perfectly you gonna hire me no. why not you're lying. <laughs> oh. <laughs> not the answer I expected <laughs> But I got to give it to her for that. OK, I'm all right. <laughs> Say what? You don't know how to over you don't know how to deal with failure. I was on the road as a rock and roll engineer for 12 years. We lived for failure because anything that could go wrong would go wrong. And Michael Jordan is the perfect example. We do not embrace the value of failure as part of the hiring construct and looking for talent. If you ha have never failed, you've never learned. Real simple. When you get folks like me, 
like her, assuming I would even be allowed in a corporate environment, <laughs> what to expect. That's roughly, that's my desk on a good day. <laughs> People that are a little different behave and work a little bit differently, because this, this, see, didn't I tell you about failure? <laughs> Perfect timing. Is that? I know it's flipping around. Something just flipped okay. there. Some people thrive in this environment. Normals find that entirely too chaotic. And depending where you may or may not be on any one of the multiple spectrums they talk about, this is either comfort or entirely too much noise. The other problem that exists, and this is where Kaylee is going to get heavily involved, is what do you got to give? What do you need to give up? What do you need to adapt to in your corporate environment to be able to allow this new, novel suite of talented, talented individuals to be able to work in your organization? And it's going to require a little bit of adjustment. Yeah. And that's what humanity is supposed to do. For us to survive as a species, we have to adapt. And thus far, the HR lady has not done a great job of adaptation. If it matters, you're going to find a way to do it. If it doesn't matter, you're going to continue to do it the way that you have been doing it. And this is the work that Kaylee decided was of some value for the messaging that she has been working on. And I'm handing it over to Kaylee Melton, who, by the way, worked for me for 12 years, and we're still friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, around this time, as I said, this was 2011-ish. I had moved to Nashville. I was out of college and a starving artist because I made the brilliant decision to get my degree in art because that's a very marketable skill. Uh, so I was getting desperate, and I decided to look on Craigslist to see if there would be anything there. Um, back in those days, jobs were frequently posted there, although there was definitely the nefarious stuff as well. So I came across the most <laughs> unique advertisement for a job I had ever seen, uh, probably that I've still seen even to this day. Um, if I had copied and pasted it into a Word document, it would have been several pages long. Um, lots of bright language, fun, a little bit um, irreverent even, and the job sounded like it was made for me. Um, the catch is that I had to go to a stranger's house <laughs> and knock on the door. Uh, luckily, because I'm on the spectrum myself, I didn't even realize that because I was a bit naive. But I luckily came to his house and not some terrible Craigslist murderer. Perv. Right. <laughs> Different kind of perv. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the point that I'm making here is that he was talking about this stuff at this time, but he was actually walking the walk as well. He wasn't just putting it out there as thought fodder. It, it was real. And through through this sort of non-conventional style and attitude, we were able to create an extremely successful company. Um, in 2011, when I joined, I was the first non-family member. There were three other people, including Wynn. And after I joined, within a year or so, uh, maybe a little more than a year, we started hiring other people. We went fully remote as well, so that people could be in their own environments, have their own setups. Um, we also operated on a row, which is a results-only work environment, which meant we don't care down to the second or minute what you're doing with your time as long as you're getting your work done. That's what's really important. And we had ultimate flexibility because we all have lives, and a lot of times jobs like to pretend that we don't have a life outside of the organization. Um, so yeah, we continued that unconventional hiring process. What it taught us was that <laughs> People like us, weirdos on the spectrum, neurodivergent, whatever you want to call it, highly creative, um, we responded really well to that um, 
to that sort of unique job posting, not only does it catch your attention, um, it also had a very lengthy written survey at the end. <laughs> and a lot of people would be like, I'm not filling out a survey before I even get an interview. But for someone like me, it was like, oh my gosh, I get to answer all this by text and I don't have to speak it and have all of that in my head. They get to know me first. Um, they ask me questions like Star Trek or Star Wars, um, as well as, you know, who's your mentor? What would you give, what advice would you give to someone who was going to be your boss? So, yes, through that, this is 2015, four years after I was hired. Uh, we had grown to this size. And then in 2016, a bit more. 2017, and 2018, and I know. And finally, 2019. This was the moment that we were already acquired by Know Before because we had become such a powerhouse in the industry. We were small but very mighty. And the key to that success was really allowing people to fulfill their own potential by creating comfortable environments that didn't stress them out, that helped them get their work done, that worked with how they worked. So that, that section I called challenges of adaptation, but I didn't really talk about that. So before I dive into that bit, let's talk about adaptation versus accommodation. So I'm an etymology nerd. You don't have to read all this, and I'm not going to read it all to you. Don't worry. But <laughs> I dove into these two words to see where they came from. And it was interesting to me the subtle differences between the two, with adaptation coming from something, how did I put this? It's, it's when you're trying to accommodate, or sorry, I used my, the wrong word. You're trying to adapt uh, a set of circumstances to something specific. So this is more for the larger picture. So you might adapt something to a new market or, I don't know, business words. But if you're a person adapting to a situation, the situation isn't adapting to you. You are adapting to it. That's the point I'm trying to make. Whereas with accommodation, the whole is accommodating you and your needs. Um, it's kind of the reverse. So the, the tendency is people like me with disabilities are required to adapt to a normal neurotypical world um, when really there are so many different ways that that world can also accommodate us and help us fulfill our potential as well. We've seen standard deviation, this fun bell curve, and when we're talking about neurotypical versus neurodivergent, um, it's kind of in the name. The neurotypical people are generally here, and then neurodivergent people kind of come off to the side here. Um, they diverge from the typical patterns. So that means there's a lot of us, for one, even though we're not the majority. And I, I in no way had to do this. I in no way have to be so forward and transparent. But I think it's really important because I'm aware that standing in front of you today, you don't know all of this stuff. Not that I need to tell everyone that, but it's important that you understand that I have and continue to face very severe challenges and have faced them from the time I was born. Um, I also created maybe one of the worst charts I've ever made. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this was me kind of thinking through the specific discriminations that I faced and then who discriminated me within those spaces. And you can see family all the way down, society all the way down, education. Luckily, I didn't have to deal with this directly, but I could have put a check here for my queer friends who couldn't hide it um, because they certainly experienced that. Um, career as well, luckily in career and industry, I haven't had that experience, but again, this is my chart, my terrible chart. Um, it's not that I'm saying it doesn't exist at all. Um, I've just been lucky enough that way. And then, of course, sexism <laughs> all the way across. So 
I also wanted to point out I have bolded and underlined these because I'm aware we're in Florida and I refuse to be silent about my own experience. But um, yeah, the, the point here is I had a lot of challenges to overcome. I had to adapt to a world that did not accommodate me whatsoever. From the, from the time I was born until now, there are so many ways it does not accommodate me. My physical disabilities, my neurological disabilities, and as you saw, there's this whole fun list. Um, but I wouldn't be here if I didn't learn the lesson of being the squeaky wheel. So the, the most exhausting part, in my opinion, of dealing with issues like this is the fatigue you get for advocating for yourself. Because no one else is going to advocate for you, at least most of the time in my experience. You have to advocate for yourself. And I've been in those situations with doctors, with people at work, where I just don't want to have to do it. It's not fair. Other people don't have to establish themselves and prove themselves over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, sometimes I'm just tired and I want someone else to take up for me. But that's not the way it works. If you think about the squeaky wheel, you're not going to grease the other wheels that aren't squeaking. You're going to grease the squeaky wheel. And so I encourage you, if you have um, disabilities, challenges, anything like that, be the squeaky wheel. Because there's other squeaky wheels out there, too, who are being really quiet, uh, I've also found, um, who will appreciate the, the squeakiness. Um, we also, here in the U.S., have the Americans with Disabilities Act. So not only is it important for you to self-advocate, um, you actually have the legal right to advocate for different accommodations from your job. I really love this resource, askjan.org. Um, it's Job Accommodation Network. Um, they have a lot of common disabilities and things listed, and you can see all the different ways that you could request accommodations for those. I remember when um, an HR lady, actually interestingly, <laughs> an HR lady uh, shared this with me, and I refer to it a lot, not only for stuff like this where I'm trying to advocate in the community, but also for myself. Oh, I've got migraines. What could I ask for um, that my employer has to provide me? And ultimately, just ask for help. None of us are good at asking for help. Um, but a lot of times when I have asked for help, I'm surprised at how immediately someone responds. If you think about when someone asks you for help, most of the time you're glad someone asked you. You're, you're, we're happy to help each other. So keep that in mind too. Our brains can be hateful to us, um, but your brain's a liar. <laughs> So let's talk about the user manual. Why is this necessary? Why, why does this play into this idea of advocating for yourself, of promoting diversity and things like that? Well, as Wynn was showing uh, earlier with the desk, um, that's a very simple way to think about this. If you think about software, hardware user manuals, they explain, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. They, they explain your system requirements, how you install that software or hardware, what you're looking at in general, um, and how you use it, different processes it's supposed to do for you or help you with. Um, and then sometimes at the end, there's a little troubleshooting section. So this idea of creating your own user manual, it's not my own. I got this from someone years ago. Unfortunately, I don't remember who. Um, but I loved it so much that it stuck with me all these years. So if you really embrace this process of deciding what makes your software run, what are your optimal operating conditions, right? Um, what, what would make your workspace, your work life, fit you better? Instead of thinking about how you can adapt to a world that may or may not have been built by people like you, what would you need that would make your experience better? And in terms of installation instructions, what happens when you are experiencing something new? Uh, what happens when you install yourself in a new position or a new boss comes or you're trying to learn something that you don't know a lot about but you're really interested in? Um, for the 
user interface diagram or overview. Think about yourself. What are your strengths and weaknesses? What is your personality like? Do you have any specific quirks? Um, for example, I work with copywriters and instructional designers, and they literally create lists for themselves to go over at the end of writing a script because they all have little grammatical quirks that they continuously make, and they've realized they need to look out for it. So at the end, they'll, they'll have a list of, like, remove 75% of the word that, um, or how many commas have you used? Did you over comma? <laughs> um, so yes, understanding what you are like, even, I don't, I don't necessarily love the idea of strengths and weaknesses, although it, it does say what it is. Um, but yeah, what is that style like? How do you work best? What do you do well? What do you love to do? What would you like to do that you're not doing? Do you have a big vision for the future? Exactly. He's told me that before. Um, I'm sure you couldn't hear that, but he said, define utopia. And anytime I'm starting a new project, anytime I'm looking to branch out, do something new, um, he always says that to me, define utopia. So applying that as well, <laughs> thanks, Wynn, um, this is really what you're doing. And finally, what debugs do you? when you're stalled out, when you're on the blue screen of death or the wheel of death and you're just staring out in a space and you're like this far away from losing it, just walking out and saying, screw it, I'm done. Um, we all have little things that help us in those moments and we might not really think about it. Um, and when you're in the middle of something like that, you're all caught up in it. It's stressful, your adrenaline's pumping, and you can't think about the things that'll calm you down as easily. It can look like anything. Um, I will show you in a bit, actually, uh, a little snapshot of my own user manual. So how could we use this? Obviously, there's the use of using it for yourself. It's a good way to get to know yourself, especially if you're either entering a career or you've been in a job for a while and you really want to know what would be better for you, an environment that you would prefer maybe. Um, this is a good way to determine where your skills are at. You can kind of think of it, if you've ever heard of a SWOT analysis, that's S-W-O-T, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. A lot of times those are used in business um, to determine whether a product is viable, things like that. But you can do that for yourself, too, and be really honest with your inventory. Um, getting to know yourself better will help you in that advocacy piece. Because if you don't know these things, perhaps you don't know you can ask for them. Perhaps you don't even realize what your working style is, what the things you need are. Um, and I can see this being used on teams as well. Um, maybe there's a new manager, or maybe you just want to have some sort of fun team building exercise in general. You could set up something like this and have each person create their own user manual and then come together and compare. I feel like it would show a lot of places where you could actually streamline and improve the workflows between people because you would understand each person a little bit better. I could see it being used for things like onboarding as well. Um, I talked about the very unique hiring process that we had at the security awareness company. Um, <laughs> clearly, you could do something like that for that, but I think as an onboarding activity, it would make a lot of sense. You're coming into this new company. They don't know you that well. It would be a good way for you to take stock of yourself and for them to understand how you're really going to fit into, into their workflows. Um, career counseling, obviously, and educators. I could totally see this being used in the classroom, especially higher ed um, going into college or about to come out of college. I, I just see a lot of use cases for it. So just a note to say that in general, everything I do and say is a choose your own adventure <laughs> because I don't think there's a one, I, I don't believe in one size fits all. Um, I guess that's obvious from my presentation, but yeah, please feel free to adapt this to whatever 
situation you have. My goal in sharing this is to foster that culture of neurodiversity. And I put neuro in parentheses because it's really just diversity in general. Um, I've talked a lot about neurodiversity today, but I have physical disabilities as well. Um, diversity is so important. I heard a comparison once that we judge an ecosystem's health and balance on the degree of its biodiversity. Why don't we look at our own ecosystems the same way? Why don't we look at the health of any given group or organization or community and, and evaluate it in terms of its health by its diversity, the same way that we do with nature? So this, yours can look much longer than this. Um, and I'm sure you can't really see it back there, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what this could look like. So system requirements. I, at this point, I've been working fully remote for well, well, well over a decade. There's no way I'm going back into the office. No, <laughs> no way. You would have to pay me so much money to get me to come back into the office. <laughs> um, but I need that interspersed with travel, specifically for stuff like this. I love to get out into the community and talk to people, share ideas. That really gets me going. Um, I also need a very flexible schedule. It's important for me to be able to take time off at a moment's notice because I have many disabilities, chronic illnesses. <laughs> Some days just aren't great. I wake up and it's just not going to happen. Some days I'll wake up, it's been a good day, and then a migraine will hit out of nowhere. Um, so I need to be able to have a very flexible schedule. But the thing is, I actually love to make work up during the off hours. Because again, on the spectrum, sometimes I get very overwhelmed. I'm a, a vice president, so I take a lot of meetings all day long. That leaves no focus time at all. Um, and it can be very exhausting being autistic and taking meetings all day long. Um, but I love to work during off hours because it's quiet. My whole house is asleep. It's dark outside. No one's texting me when. Um, <laughs> now that's bullshit. <laughs> but um, yeah, I also prefer to work with a strong team. I used to be a solo artist, I guess you could say. Uh, I always hated team projects in school because I was a goody two shoes and was like, Ugh, they're just going to make me do all the work and then take the credit. Why would I just, why don't I just do it myself? Um, but now that I understand what teamwork is and have worked with and helped build such a strong team, I know that for me to do my best work, I need to be able to delegate things. I need people to be able to do things that they're good at that I'm kind of eh at. Um, and as I said, I need flow. If you really want me to get things done and not just have meetings with people, I'm going to need a block of time that's just mine so that I can sink into that flow state. Installation instructions. Throw as much at me as you can. Throw it all at me, because I, otherwise I'm going to think that the information you've given me is all that there is, and I'll put my heart and soul into that. Give all of it, give all of it to me at once, but then let me digest and integrate it, because that's also very overwhelming. Here's 500 pages. Tell me what you think about it tomorrow. Um, <laughs> active mentorship and guidance has been really important for me, especially once the security awareness company integrated into Know Before. Moving into a more corporate environment, I had mentors internally and externally um, that really helped me when I would come up against really difficult problems, those difficult conversations that you have to have as a boss, things like that. Um, in terms of my components or my diagram, I'm compassionate. I always lead compassion first. I even have it tattooed on me in Sanskrit. Um, I'm ambitious as well, obviously, very determined. <laughs> um, but that's because I'm a natural leader. And it's from that place of compassion, of wanting to see the people around me do and be their best. That, that's the best drug, in my opinion. Um, I love problem solving. 
I'm an opportunist. I generally take opportunities when they come to me, no matter how crazy they are. That's not entirely true, but not entirely true. Uh, I get a big high from conquering impossible things. I don't know how many times in the last year I was given a project and told by my boss, this is going to be impossible. And my response was, bet. <laughs> and I've come through on all of those, not just me, but my team. We've been able to make the impossible happen. I love that. Um, yes, I, I definitely wanted to include the Spock slash Kirk quote, the needs of the many outweigh the few or the one, because that's also how, how I lead in general. Also shows you how much of a giant nerd I am. I prefer anything artistic. That's how you would use my software. Uh, anything creative. I love making things more efficient. Uh, I'm really good at resource management. <coughs> resource management. Um, I love bringing out the best in people. I consider myself a bit of a shapeshifter. <laughs> um, and games are my jam, just in general. I've done a lot of research and initiatives around gaming to learn. And trust me, if you want to nerd out about that, I'm here for it. <laughs> um, and finally, troubleshooting. Like I said, we don't always know what we need when we're in a high stress state. Um, so for me, over time, I've realized it's, it's kind of important to schedule downtime. I know like work is fun and all, but kind of important to take vacations. <laughs> um, and for me, being in nature is so satisfying. It's what recharges my batteries more than anything. Uh, I also like to have in-person team meetings. So again, even though I'm a hermit most of the time, I do really need those opportunities to get out, actually see someone in my space rather than on a 2D Zoom screen and um, just hang out brainstorm together, throw ideas back and forth. It's just different. Um, and it's important for me to be able to make a measurable impact overall. So a lot of times when I need debugging, it's because I've lost sight of my own part of the process, my own part to making things successful. So this is the basics of the user manual from my interpretation of it. I'd love to show you just a quick glance at something else that I'm working on in the background. Um, I didn't have it done in time for this, um, but I thought you would enjoy seeing it. Also, this is pretty irregular for me to not have any images. So there's images, and I think you'll enjoy that. So I, I mentioned how much I love games, um, especially gaming to learn. Right now, I'm reading the book Reality is Broken by Jane McGonigal. Although I'm not finished with it, I highly recommend it. It's a book about how our society really needs to inject itself with a lot of the game mechanics that games have in order to get people to buy back into being in this reality versus being in a fantasy reality. Um, she also talks about alternate reality games like Super Better and Ch uh, Chore Wars. These are games that take an idea, a storyline, some little mechanics from a traditional game. Often these are online based through a browser or an app. And they bring those mechanics into your everyday life. So for example, Super Better was created by Jane, if I'm not mistaken, um, because she had a horrible concussion that lasted six months plus, And it just didn't go away, even though it was supposed to. And she needed something to motivate her to, to get better. And so she created Super Better, where you create your superhero alias, you recruit people to your team, and each day they give you very small, manageable achievements to work towards. So for her, it could have been um, don't. She, she kept making it worse by doing things she wasn't supposed to reading, being on the computer, playing games, things like that. So hers were actually opposite. Have only this amount of time of games or computer time today versus how we usually think about it. Like, I want to spend more and more and more and more time. Um, 
but by creating this, she actually created something that we can all now benefit from. Um, the, the core message that she has is that humans actually love hard fun. Like just fun, it's not good enough. The reason we're so addicted to games is because we genuinely like to be challenged. We genuinely like to fail. There was a study done that showed people release the most excitement during gameplay when they're failing. At the point of failure, highest excitement, highest amount of pleasure, which is not what they expected to find. So I have created this idea called DivergeNet. Um, I'm a Dungeons and Dragons nerd, so if you're not familiar with that, you create a character, and your character has a race like elf, gnome, dwarf, high fantasy type things, uh, and then classes like sorcerer, warlock, rogue. So I am creating this world based on the user manual concept of races and classes that you can pick that help you determine what kind of accommodations you might need, empower you to see where your strengths are, see them as super, your own superpowers. Um, yeah, so just a quick view. We've got the augments. Um, you can see up in the top right, I've been mapping different things to each of these. Um, originally, the augments I had in mind for physical disabilities, but as you'll see, I added that to every slide because people with physical disabilities can do anything. Um, we also have drifters. Um, this is people who have PTSD or other trauma-generated disorders or ADHD. And the reason is because they are naturally adaptable, resilient, and the things they need include high levels of freedom, autonomy, flexibility, variety. Um, and if you think about the stereotype of a drifter, even in a cyberpunk world, you could, it gives you that visual connection, something fun and outside yourself to connect yourself to. We have empaths, archivists, ghost synths, my favorite, <laughs> people who are able to walk without trace in cyberspace, psilocyrens, Uh, Firebrands, another one of my favorites, <laughs> your classic red teamers. And then when we're looking at the classes, we've got the circuit hermit, <laughs> the net runner, cyber knights, blue teamers, technomancer, that's also probably my favorite, if not just for the name alone, uh, the wire corsair, and the mind weaver. Uh, and the fate hackser. I had to add something for quantum in there, of course. Uh, so like I said, that's not done. This is just something I stumbled into while I was doing this, and I'm really excited by it. So even if I'm the only one who ever uses it, that's fine. But it's an example of how you can gamify these things as well, on top of just creating the user manual in general. Um, resources, I highly recommend the NICE framework if you're curious about jobs, you're early in your cybersecurity career. Um, it's just, they, they've done an amazing job. Huge, nice fan. Um, and they've also created this PDF uh, of career paths, and they've actually kind of uh, created gamified personas for each of their different jobs as well. Um, all I remember is there's a wizard in there, uh, which naturally, of course, that's the only thing I remember. But yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. I have a question. OK. The game that you're working on, yeah. I didn't know that until today. <laughs> yeah. um, are you building it in an existing like Roblox platform, or what are you doing it in? I don't know. I, it literally just happened as I was putting this presentation together. Oh, OK. So, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is yet. I'm working on it. 